Okay, um, I think we can start. Uh, some people are still uh, slowly joining. Um, uh, so, uh, thank you for joining our, our first Polycon UK webinar. Today we have Ines Moreno de Barreda from Oxford, who is going to talk to us about persuasion with correlation neglect. This is a joint work with Gilad Levy and Ron Raisin, who are also present today. Um, before I hand over to Ines, let me remind you that these webinars take place every other Monday at 3 p.m. UK time. Uh, in two weeks, we will have with us Noam Utman from LSE. As usual, uh, you can find more information about the coming list of speakers on our website, and we encourage you to follow us on Twitter. The format of these seminars is as follows. Uh, we will have about 15 minutes of the presentation with time for perhaps clarifying interim questions. And this will be followed by a 10 minute discussion or questions. We would request uh, all attendees to keep your microphones muted and uh, uh, to keep your cameras off. Uh, but you can ask questions via chat and some of these questions may be answered by co-authors in the chat, but also if these are clarifying questions clarifying questions, uh, we may ask the speaker during the presentation. And the remaining questions will be postponed to the Q&A sessions at the end. Um, thank you, Ines. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And let me start by thanking Max, Francesco and Ariana for setting this uh, series of seminars. This is exciting and thank you for inviting me to be the first one pre presenting in this series. So, uh, as Max said, uh, this is a paper joined with Gilad Levy and Ronnie Racing, who are here. I hope that I don't throw too many bad questions to you <laughs> while I'm presenting here. Okay, so the paper title is Persuasion with Correlation Neglect, and the story is as follows. Let me see. Yeah, first, first problem is that, okay, it's moving. Okay, great. So, we live in the era of information. Uh, we are surrounded by lots of different sources of information and uh, the complexity of uh, the information that we receive opens the opportunity uh, to manipulate beliefs of voters and consumers. So uh, here I've um, quoted a little bit some, some examples of uh, this sort of manipulation. Um, so in the last uh, four years we have uh, witnesses uh, several I mean, instances in, 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 in political campaigns in which uh, we had um, problems of coordination in, in the media world. Uh, so a few years ago, there was Fox speed over Sky. I mean, I know that at the end, uh, Comscat was the one that uh, ended up buying Sky, but I mean, uh, the bit of Fox was uh, put on to a halt because the Murdoch Family Trust uh, had a lot of influence across uh, many different uh, companies and I mean, folks and, and, and Sky, and, and this could potentially be a problem of, uh, in, I mean, in terms of manipulating on, of the information, manipulation of the information that the, that the consumers got. Uh, and finally, in the social networks platforms, I mean, in Facebook as well, uh, is under a lot of pressure again. And, and, and uh, he announced last year that he was removing pages and groups and accounts uh, that were engaged in coordinated inauthentic behavior uh, because they wanted to stop uh, this sort of activity uh, that they think, uh, are, uh, I mean, their goal is to manipulate people and people's beliefs uh, using fake accounts and, and to misrepresent themselves. Okay, uh, a final uh, instance of a social network uh, manipulation, very badly done, was uh, last December on the general election debate, in which the conservative headquarters and Twitter account to change their name suddenly to, to look like uh, they were an independent uh, fact check uh, um, account, uh, although this was uh, later on discovered and, and they said that it, this wasn't misleading at all, or no intention, uh, but intentions were there. Okay, so we have this, 
So we have all these campaigns and informations that may be correlated uh, from one side, but on the other side, voters and consumers uh, might struggle to correctly aggregate the information. Okay, so the literature has recently documented many environments in which um, um, consumers uh, have correlation neglect. And by correlation neglect, I'm gonna be, I mean, more precise in, in a little while, but we mean, um, I mean, people take information as if, as if they were independent rather than uh, correlated, okay? So that's, that's um, one issue. Another issue is that maybe, so Kajia, Ve and, and Dio, they report that most uh, online content is not original, uh, but rather, I mean, is repeated, repackaged, and uh, without any reference of the original content. So, I mean, consumers really struggle to know whether different sources of information are independent or not, okay? So what are we doing in this paper? What we are gonna do is we are gonna analyze a model of information design in which the receiver has correlation neglect. So there will be, I mean, some uncertainty that we model with a binary state of the world and the sender is gonna design M signals to influence the receiver, to manipulate the posterior that the receiver forms about the state of the world, okay? Uh, the receiver is going to, I mean, understands, it's sophisticated somehow, so he, uh, she understands the marginal information structure of each of the signals. Uh, however, uh, she believes that each of these information structures are conditionally independent. So, so it's not a feature, this is not a paper about fake news, so, so people, I mean, the receiver understands the signals. Uh, it's, it's, it's a paper of not recognizing the, the correlation that might be underlying, I mean, in the underlying uh, information structure. And the questions that uh, we are uh, trying to solve is how can a sender use correlation in a strategic way to manipulate a receiver who believes that the information is in the, are independent, right? And uh, what is the scope of manipulation when the receiver has correlation neglect? So um, before going into the model, I'm going to present here uh, the main uh, results that we have uh, in the paper. Some of them I'm not going to cover in this presentation because it's a short presentation, but at least you have an idea of what we are doing here. And then I will pause to see whether there is any uh, question, clarifying question that uh, might help at this point. Okay. So. Um, this is the preview of the result. The first result, and this is something that I'm not going to cover in this presentation, is that we are going to characterize um, the set of um, distribution of a vector of posterior. So each signal is going to uh, is going to induce a posterior for the receiver, and therefore, because we have many signals, we will have many posteriors that the receiver forms, right? And uh, we are going to characterize the set of distributions over these procedures that uh, can come from a signal structure. Um, and the thing that I want you to keep in mind from this is that uh, using um, full correlation is something that is uh, relatively easy. So you just have to produce a signal and repeat it over and over again. Uh, however, if you want to induce negative correlation in a distribution, this is going to be harder somehow. So, so although I'm not going to go over the characterization, the characterization is in the paper, I will give some hint of why uh, implementing negative correlation in the posteriors of the receiver is a bit harder. Okay. Uh, once we cover the feasibility, so we are going to look at uh, the correlation neglect heuristic of the receiver and we are going to cover two features of this correlation neglect heuristic. One is an amplification effect and uh, what this means is that uh, upon receiving good news, several good news, uh, the receiver will update the posterior in a very extreme way leading to a very, very positive, even more positive posterior than, than what the signals indicate. Okay, so, so, so there will be an amplification effect uh, in, the, in the sense that uh, it's going to be possible to induce very extreme posteriors on the receiver by uh, using several signals, okay? Then we are gonna look at uh, the isobelief curve. So, so the set of, um, I mean, different signals that might lead to the same correlation neglect posterior. 
and we are going to uncover some shape of these isobelief curves and we are going to see that depending on the shape of these isobelief curves uh, the sender will have an incentive to use full correlation or an incentive to use negative correlation so i'm going to spend a uh, quite a lot of time uh, well, on, on these features in the talk okay then uh, we are going to go into what's, I mean, uh, the optimal information structure and we are going to start uh, looking at full correlation. And um, we are going to first see what is the optimal uh, full correlation structure that the sender can use if he's restricted to use just repeated signals. So how should the sender do that? Uh, and once we solve for that problem, which we are going to do by modifying and the problem and using some standard concavification con techniques, um, I'm going to see whether when that solution to this uh, full correlation, optimized full correlation uh, problem uh, is optimal overall. So, so now if we are not restricted to use full correlation, when is full correlation optimal? Okay, so, so, and we are going to see that uh, when the priors are sufficiently unfavorable to the sender, uh, the sender is going to be willing to fully correlate. And then, I mean, we also have some results on more sophisticated uh, uh, preferences for the sender. So, so if the sender's utility is supermodular on the posteriors of the receiver, then uh, it's also going to be optimal to fully correlate. Uh, and in general, if we allow the number of signals that the sender can use to go to infinity, so as we increase the number of signals, then uh, we are going to be able to uh, approximate the first best of the sender by using full correlation. So full correlation is something that is quite powerful, very powerful if, have, if we have many signals, if we have some, I mean, a limited number of signals, then it could even be optimal when the prior is sufficiently against the sender. Okay. Then um, we, we are going to show as well that uh, if the prior is sufficiently favorable for the, I mean, to the sender, so, so, so if, if there's no a lot of con convincing that uh, the sender has to do, not, not a lot of persuasion that the sender has to do uh, to the receiver, then uh, using negative correlation is going to be optimal. And, and in general, uh, when the sender's utility is submodular on the posteriors of the receiver, this is going to be the, the optimal information structure. So the optimal information structure will have some negative correlation. And uh, we are going to also see, although I don't think that we will have time to, to cover this in this presentation, that uh, for general preferences that might be state dependent uh, and arbitrary number of states, we are going to be able to approximate the sender's first best uh, by, I mean, if, if the number of signals goes to infinity by using an information structure that will incorporate some negative correlation as well. Okay, so, so this is the preview of the results. Uh, and um, I think that um, unless someone wants to stop me uh, right now, it would be better if I make the pose after the model. So everyone is with me on, what we are uh, talking about, uh, but if someone wants to stop me, just uh, let me know. So this is the outline of the talk. Uh, we are going to start with the model. Uh, I'm going to just very briefly talk a little bit about feasibility of signal structures, but in a very kind of intuitive way. And then I'm going to spend some time on the correlation characteristic and the implications that it has on information structures and then cover the optimal correlation structures. I don't think I will have time to go over number five and six, but uh, maybe, who knows. Okay, so let me start with the model and then I will stop and, and ask whether someone has any questions. Okay, so uh, there are two players, a sender and a receiver. I will I mean, refer to both of them as she and sometimes as he because I mix it all the time. Uh, so, so it's good that, I mean, if, if I say he, you won't know who I refer to, and if I say she, you won't know either, but I hope that by the context it will be clear. Mm. Uh, there is a binary state of the world, so the world can be either zero or one, and there's going to be a commonly known prior that I'm going to denote by P, which is the probability that the state is equal to one. Okay? Uh, the sender is going to design an information structure uh, which consists of m distinct signals that the sender is going to send to the receiver. 
and the receiver, upon observing the realization of the M signals, is going to choose an action A on a compact set. Uh, and now, given the action A and the state omega, the receiver gets a utility U of A omega, and the sender gets utility V of A omega. Okay, and we are going to just assume sufficiently smoothness and everything so that, I mean, uh, we can work with this model. So in particular, I'm going to assume that there is a unique optimal action for the receiver. Uh, and given some, I mean, uh, beliefs that uh, the receiver has about the state of the world and that uh, the UDD of the sender is continuous in the edge. Okay, uh, so what are these signals? So an informational structure with M signals is going to be defined by a realization set. So, so the realization set S, bold S, is just a product of all the different realizations that the different signals might have, okay? And then there will be a joint conditional uh, probability, uh, which uh, states, so Q of S1 is M given omega is the probability that the realization S1 is M is realized when the state is omega, okay? And sometimes uh, I'm gonna be emphasizing a particular signal, so I, I, I'm going to um, use the subscript i for a particular signal, si, and uh, the qi is just, uh, I mean, you can derive it from the joint information structure as usual just by summing up all uh, the probabilities by, I mean, when, when you fix a particular realization for signal i, okay? Now, as it is common in the Bayesian persuasion literature, uh, given that the sender has to choose this signal structure, it's not, I mean, it's, it's not very, we, we have a very big choice space and it's not very, it's not going to be very convenient to work with signals. And uh, what we really care about is what each signal uh, induces in terms of posteriors of our receiver. Uh, so what we are going to do is we are going to look at signals as distributions over posteriors. So let me be a little bit more clear. Um, a posterior mu is going to be identified by the probability that the receiver, for instance, uh, allocates to the state being equal to 1. And uh, if the signal realization, if a signal realization is SI, well, the receiver is going to use that signal in order to update their beliefs and using base rules. So this is a Bayesian updater. And, and the receiver is going to use base rule as usual in order to find out what is his belief, or sorry, her belief, about the state of the world being equal to one, okay? Now, uh, so a signal SI induces a posterior V of SI, and with which probability, well, a uh, posterior mu of SI is going to be induced whenever the realization SI uh, arises, so with probability QI of SI, okay? So, so in particular, this signal i can be interpreted as a, if we had a probability a, over, that I'm gonna call tau, over the different posteriors that these signals induce, okay? A, so this is for a particular signal i, but in our model, I mean, everything comes from the correlation of different signals. So in our model, the sender is choosing a joint information structure, okay? And um, so, so what we will see is that uh, this problem, the problem of choosing a joint information structure over M signal is equivalent to choosing a pair, to, a pair of joint conditional distributions tau, one for state equal to one and one for the state of the world equal to zero, over vectors of posteriors. Why vectors of posteriors? Because each signal is going to use but a different posterior, right? So the M signals induces a vectors of posteriors, right? And, and the condition that we need to satisfy is that for every marginal, the, the, the posterior has to be consistent, to, consistent, consistent with this variation updating, right? So, so it has to satisfy um, the, the base rule, knowing that, uh, I mean, mu i is kind of the realization of our signal here. So, so this, this, this equation is what we call conditional constraints, and this is really a, a consistency requirement a, in order to be able to represent a, these signals as a distributions over posteriors. Okay? 
Um, now, uh, once the receiver gets all these uh, signals, uh, we are going to assume that the, the receiver perfectly update, I mean, understands the marginal distribution. So the tau i are perfectly understood uh, by the receiver, but the receiver is going to treat all signals as if they were conditionally independent. So the assumption that we are making is that if you give me a joint information structure, so that's a joint uh, probability over different vectors of posteriors, uh, the receiver is going to understand the marginals and then think that the, the, the joint uh, probability of these vectors of posteriors is given by the product of those marginals. So this is, this is really the uh, behavioral trait that uh, our receiver has. Now, using uh, this multiplicative form of uh, this updating that uh, the receiver has and using the conditional constraints that we had from before, we can, uh, given a vector of posteriors, we can find out what is the correlation neglect posterior that the receiver will form. And, and this, you don't need to look at this formula too hard. I'm going to spend some time in a few slides on it, on them. And, uh, but, but this formula inherits, as I said, the, the product um, from, from, from the independence, uh, I mean, assumption, uh, the ability in uh, thinking that the, that the different marginals are independent of each other, and the consistency of these conditional constraints, okay? Now, given a, a particular posterior that the receiver might form, we are going to denote by A mu the optimal action that the receiver uh, will have. So that's the action that maximizes the expected utility of the receiver. And now we are set to set up the sender's problem. So what does the sender want to do? The sender wants to find out what are these joint information structures, right, in order to maximize the expected payoff of the sender, which is, well, with probability P, the state is equal to 1. This is the distributions that are going to be realized. So uh, with this probability, the vector of posterior mu will happen, and then our receiver is going to update using this mu CN of mu, and this is the utility that the sender is going to have at that, case, at that point, and then uh, this is the same thing for the case in which the state is equal to zero, right? So this is the expected utility of the sender, given that information structure, and uh, subject to, well, the, the correlation neglect heuristic that we are imposing on, on, on the receiver, and uh, the conditional constraints that uh, we need. So these consistencies requirements that we need in order for this distribution of vectors of, 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 of posteriors to come from a signal structure, okay? Now, uh, a few comments uh, before uh, we got into analyzing the problem. The first thing is that we can restrict the analysis uh, to distributions that have identical marginals. So you can think of a particular, I mean, all the signals to be symmetric and the sender only having to, uh, I mean, think of uh, how to correlate the different marginals, okay? And this is without loss of generality. If we had, um, I mean, different signals with different uh, marginal distributions, we can um, form another information structure that uh, will be symmetric and leads to the, exactly the same expected payoff as the original one, okay? Uh, and one more thing, if the sender has state-independent preferences, then this expected uh, utility for the sender can be written in a, in, in a much simpler form. Uh, so it's going to be just the unconditional expected uh, utility that the, that, the, that the sender derives. And from most, for most of the presentation today, I'm going to assume that this is the case. I'm going to assume that the sender uh, has state-independent preferences. And in fact, I'm going to assume that these preferences are increasing in the receiver's belief. So I'm going to, with a bit of abuse of notation, I'm going to, instead of writing V of A, I'm going to write A of, of mu. I'm going to write V bar of mu uh, as representing V of the optimal action that the receiver takes whenever uh, the belief of the receiver is equal to you. 
Okay, so this is this is the end of the setting of the model. So this is a good time to stop in case there are any questions. Um, so oh. th there was a, a question in the chat, but uh, I think your co-authors answered that. Um, so uh, please go ahead. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk very briefly about what are the implications of these conditional constraints that uh, the probability of uh, vectors of, of posteriors need to satisfy in order for them to come from a signal structure. Okay, so, so these, these are the conditional constraints and the posteriors have to agree with this uh, base rule. Okay, now uh, if we look at this formula uh, and I manipulate it a little bit, so I multiply this formula by tau i of mu i here, right? Uh, and I add up across all potential posteriors that signal i induces, then uh, we are going to have that the expected posterior, so this is the sum of tau i mu i times mu i, will have to be equal to the prior. So this, this constraint is what is called in literature the values and plausibility uh, constraint, and every single signal has to satisfy this. Uh, in fact, I mean, Kamenik and Kensko 2011 Bayesian persuasion paper established that this is a, an if and only if. So any kind of a information structure that satisfies this Bayesian possibility a constraint comes from or potential can potentially come from from a signal structure. Okay. Uh, however, in their paper, uh, they are considering signal. I mean, a, a unique single signal, right? And in, in, in this paper, it is very important that we keep all the individual signals separately because our receiver is not going to rightly aggregate all the different signals, okay? And the question is, well, if we are trying to look at which sort of probabilities of a vector of posteriors can be generated with M signal, is this a uh, Bayesian possibility constraint uh, enough. So um, if we are dealing with um, probability distributions uh, in which uh, the signals are fully correlated, this is indeed the case. So let me let me stop a little bit here because you are going to see graphs like these ones uh, later on in the presentation. So what I'm representing here is a case in which there are only two signals because I cannot draw with more dimension than two. So there is signal mu uh, one that is going to induce a posterior mu one and there is signal two that is going to induce a posterior mu two, okay? And any point in this square is going to be a vector of posteriors, right? If we lie on the diagonal, it means that both signals are inducing the same posterior. So this is like if we had a signal that we are repeating twice. Okay. Now, uh, because we know that a single signal is a, I mean, so a distribution of a posterior might come from a signal structure if it satisfies the Bayesian possibility, that's, that's a Kaminsky and Gesko result. Well, we can, we can always replicate it twice and, 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 um, and this is also going to come from a signal structure. Okay, so, so full cor a full correlation distribution is inducible by a signal structure if and only if it satisfies by some possibility. However, if we wanted to induce some full negative correlation like this one, so in this particular case, we have two vectors in the support of this distribution, mu1 and mu2. And uh, assume that the Bayesian possibility constraint is satisfied, so they average up to the prior, which is what Bayesian possibility says, right? Well, still, even though this distribution satisfies Bayesian possibility, this is this is not going to be feasible. And intuitively, um, whenever the receives, um, uh, whenever the receiver observes a uh, mu in the first signal. The receiver is observing mu prime in the second signal, right? And, and these two realizations happen simultaneously, always at the same time, and never if they never happen if, if they are not together. And therefore, a Bayesian updater should should update in the same way uh, whenever he receives this mu or this mu prime here. So, so the only way that we can do that if is 
is if mu is equal to mu prime, okay? So if we wanted to introduce negative correlation, we need to be a little bit more subtle. And what our characterization, which I'm not gonna show here, shows is that uh, if you want to introduce negative correlation, you will need to mix it with some fully correlated points in the support. Like for example, in this case, we, we have these mu2 and mu3 that are negatively correlated. And we can do that because we have added this extra vector in the support of this signal, okay? And uh, we can do that with these weights, uh, which are not really important. But one thing that I want you to realize is that um, if you look at these formulas, um, the farther apart are these negative correlations. So the farther apart are mu and mu prime, the smallest is gonna be the weight that we are gonna be able to put on these points. And the highest is the weight that we have to put on the fully correlated points. So there's a limit to the negative correlation that we can induce. Okay, so this is, a, this is what I want you to keep in mind, that negative correlation is something that is a little bit harder to induce. You can do some, but not too much, okay? So now I'm gonna uh, focus on the correlation neglect heuristic. Uh, so this is the formula that I told you not to look too much, okay? Um, so let me start with uh, three observations. The first one is that if we have a single signal, this, is, this formula is gonna simplify and uh, the correlation neglect um, posterior that this receiver forms is just the posterior. Okay, so if this uh, receiver only receives a signal, this receiver is completely rational. It's perfectly aggregating the information because this receiver is sophisticated somehow. They understand each single individual signal uh, perfectly well in isolation. Okay, now if we were sending uninformative signals, so a vectors of uh, signals that lead to the posterior, the equal to the prior, then uh, nothing is going to happen. So, so this, uh, this receiver is going to just think that uh, we are as well as before. So, so it's, it's, the posterior is going to be equal to the prior. And in fact, I could have written here a more sophisticated uh, condition. So if, if one of the signals lead to a um, posterior that is equal to the prior, then the overall uh, mu CN is like if we just threw out this particular signal and look only at the A minus one remaining signals, okay? Um, and then another feature that is gonna be quite um, useful for us is that this correlation neglect heuristic is independent of the actual uh, information structure, right? The actual distribution over posterior. So it only depends on and the support of that distribution and not on the actual probabilities that we allocate to those vectors of posteriors. Now, um, one thing that this heuristic has is what I, we call the amplification effect. And what we mean by that is that if, um, if a receiver gets M signals, all of them being good news, right? And by good news, I mean that all of them uh, lead to a posterior that is above the prior, uh, with at least one being strictly above the prior, then um, the correlation neglect heuristic is gonna be even more positive. So it's higher than the maximum of all these posteriors. This is what I meant in the introduction as this heuristic leading to more extreme values, okay? Uh, analogously, if um, the realization of all the posteriors, um, I mean, are kind of pessimistic, are below the prior, then the correlation neglect heuristic is gonna uh, be even more pessimistic, even more extreme, lower than the minimum of those posteriors, okay? In particular, if we look at the full, uh, full positive correlation, so, uh, and again, oopsie, and again, I want to spend some uh, time in this graph because this is gonna come up later on as well. So um, suppose that we have a signal, uh, this signal induces a posterior between zero and one here, and this is new, okay? And suppose now that we just repeat this signal m times. This is what we mean by full positive correlation. We are just repeating this signal over and over again, okay? 
then the correlation neglect heuristic that is going to mean or the posterior that the receiver is going to have will have this shape here so we know that at p it coincides with p right so if all the signals uh, and lead to a posterior of p then then uh, the posterior of the correlation neglect receiver is also p but uh, it's going to be more extreme so leading to a far more negative posterior or closer to zero posterior right uh, whenever we send something that is below the, uh, the prior and to a quite positive posterior if we send something that is slightly above the prior so it has this amplification effect okay great so we are going to see that this is useful for some limiting results later on uh, and now let's look at the isobelief curves so what are these isobelief curves this is the set of vectors of posteriors that have that result in the same correlation neglect posterior for the receiver okay uh, this is the formula that you can i mean if you manipulate this this correlation neglect heuristic this is the formula that i get why is this interesting it's just because um, i mean you can see from this formula that the shape of these isobelief curves it's going to be independent of p the level of the posterior will depend on p but at the end i mean uh, which which vectors of posteriors lead to the same uh, correlation neglect posterior are those who have the same kind of product of these uh, hazard rates if you want okay uh, so the shape of these isobelief curves are independent of the prior p and just to uh, visualize them a little bit let's go back to the case of just two signals so we have signal one leading to a posterior of mu one somewhere here and signal one uh, signal two leading to a posterior mu two on the vertical axis okay and uh, as i said i mean a point in this square is just a vector over posteriors so how are these isobelief curves uh, in this case of two signals they look like this right so they are concave on this bottom uh, sorry convex on this bottom half and they are concave on the upper half of this uh, square okay so upper triangle um, and as i said these these isobelief curves the shape of these isobelief curves are not uh, don't don't depend on on the prior p and uh, the blue line here corresponds to the belief of one minus p so what does that mean it means that if we have a prior that is above a half then these isobelief curves is going to be something that is smaller than one half so our prior is going to be on this kind of concave area uh, of this square and if the prior is low then we are going to end up on this area here right so if the prior is say a one quarter then this blue line corresponds to a posterior uh, a correlated neg neglect posterior equal to three quarters so I mean, our prior is going to lie on a isobelief curve that is convex, right? Now, yes. Uh, yes. Um, uh, I'm looking at the clock. We have about ten minutes. Oh my God! Okay, so no, it's plenty of time. Okay, <laughs> okay. So uh, this is quite important. So what? Why are these isobelief curves? The shape of these isobelief curves important? And, and in fact, I mean, these these properties extend to more than two signals. So I can only draw it for two signals, but they extend for more than two signals. Well, because if we have a a, a distribution, so an information structure that has support on vectors like this one. So we have two vectors, mu one and mu two. Uh, on 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 an iso belief curve that is convex right so then uh, it would be much better for a sender that wants to induce um, a high posterior to the, to the receiver it would be better to uh, collapse these two signals and use a perfect correlated a fully positive correlated signal at mu hat this is still going to satisfy the Bayesian plausibility constraint so it's something that is going to be feasible and we are going to end up in an iso belief curve that is above the previous one okay so so if we are if the action happens in this convex area there will be an incentive to fully correlate on the other hand if we have a point in the support of a distribution that lies uh, in a concave isobelief curve then 
we will have an incentive to add some negative correlation, right? Um, so by doing something like that, I mean, it is true that we have this mu three, three that might light on a lower isobelief curve, but we are gonna be able to induce a much higher isobelief curve in mu one and mu two, and this might lead to higher utility for the sender. Right, so again, if we are, uh, if the action is happening on this kind of concave area of isobelief curves, then there will be an incentive to negatively correlate. Okay, so let's go now to what are the optimal correlation structures. And as I said, I'm going to start by solving the problem. Suppose that uh, the sender has her hands tied and can only repeat signals. It's like, I mean, you can post something and you know that people are going to copy these signals all and all over again, but I mean, you cannot manage too much the correlation between them. You can only play with full correlation, okay? In that case, what would be the optimal full correlation structure? A way of solving that is by transforming our problem into a unidimensional variation persuasion problem in which instead of choosing, I mean, a distribution over a vector of posteriors, we are just choosing one posterior and we are replicating it over and over again. Okay, so this is the standard um, Kamenik and go problem and the way to solve this is by using concavification techniques. Okay, so, sorry. So, so uh, again, this is the same graph as I showed before. Suppose that we have a signal. This is the signal that we are using and this signal is going to be repeated over and over again. This signal uh, is going to induce some distribution over posteriors here. Oopsie. And um, if we don't do anything and we send our prior, so an informative signal, we end up at this point here. This point, this curve represents the uh, utility of the sender when you when the sender replicates the same signal n times. And uh, it has this shape. This is not something uh, arbitrary. So this shape is inherited from the correlation neglect heuristic. Um, as long as there are sufficiently enough signals, uh, our the, the utility of the sender will end up being convex here and concave on the other side of, of the prior, okay? Now, how do you solve that? Well, using concavification techniques, you can send, you can uh, use a distribution over posteriors that uh, put some weight on mu star, and whenever mu star is realized, you end up with a very high utility for the sender, and then some other weight on zero uh, leading to a, a zero expected utility for, I mean, a zero utility for the sender. And uh, the expected utility for the sender is gonna be just a weighted average of these two things. And uh, it reaches the value of V star, which as we can see is better than not sending any information at all. Okay, so this is the, 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 pro, I mean, the solution of the standard um, uh, variation persuasion problem. And this is what we are going to use in order to solve for this um, fully correlated case, okay? Now, when is this solution uh, optimal overall? Optimal even if you can introduce some negative correlation, you can play with any variable that you want. Uh, and the answer is going to come by looking at uh, the graphs that I presented beforehand, okay? So the first, the first, the left-hand side graph here, uh, I'm plotting the different a um, fully correlated correlation neglect uh, posteriors for different priors. And as you can see here, uh, when the prior is very low, like 0 0.1 here, and if we, if we try to solve our problem by concavifying as, as we did before, we are gonna try to induce a mu star that is relatively low, something around, I mean, maybe even less than 0 0.5, right? Now, if our prior was 0.1, uh, remember that I told you that this blue line here corresponds to a posterior, a correlation neglect posterior of 1 minus p. So this corresponds to a correlation neglect posterior of 0 0.9, which means that, I mean, the, the, the correlation neglect posterior 0 0.5 is also around this, this side. So we are on the convex side of these isobelief curves. And, and therefore, there will not be any incentive to introduce negative correlation. And, and, and this is what indeed goes on, right? So uh, if we have a state independent utility for the sender that is increasing in the posterior of the receiver, 
Uh, then there exists a threshold, a prior, is, I mean, a threshold for the prior such that if the prior is sufficiently smaller than that, the optimal information structure exhibits full correlation, okay? Now, suppose on the contrary that we are working with very high um, priors, like the 0 0.91 here, right? So we are uh, working with this prior and we concavify this prior, well, we will always end up with a point up here that lies on the concave side of our isobelief curves. Remember that if P is equal to 0 0.9, this blue line would correspond to a correlation neglect posterior of 0 0.1. So most of the action is going on here. So there will be an incentive to introduce negative correlation up here, right? So indeed, I mean, for an increasing utility function, and we need an extra assumption for the negative correlation to, to, to still be, uh, but this is a technical thing profitable, right? And there exists a threshold for the priors su such that if the priors are above that threshold, full correlation is not optimal, you want to introduce some negative correlation. And to fix ideas, uh, let's look at a particular example. So this is the example in which the M is equal to two, so the center can only send two signals, okay? And these, I mean, binary signals, and we have a uh, expected utility that uh, depends, I mean, the utility of the center depends, it's just the posterior of the receiver, right? So V of mu is just mu. Well, the optimal solution in this case is whenever the prior is below 0 0.514, so it's not such a, I mean, it's, it's not such a small prior if you want, okay? Then the optimal solution is to fully correlate. Um, so in the, in the, when the state of the world is one, you will, I mean, you will generate a posterior, um, the two signals individually will generate a posterior of a square root of P, right? And this will happen with priority one, okay? When the state is equal to zero, you will alternate between zero and, and this uh, square root of p. Uh, oops. However, when um, p is above this threshold, then we observe that the optimal information structure involves some negative correlation. When the state, is, when the realized state is equal to one, then uh, the sender is fully negatively correlating between uh, inducing a, a posterior of one and some middle posterior. Uh, uh, in order to send with priority equal to one, this middle posterior when the state is equal to zero. Okay, so I have one more minute. Uh, just I, I think that I'm just going to present this extra uh, result, which says that um, if we allow more and more signals, then we can make use of the amplification effect that I uh, explained before, and. Um, uh, so you can look at this graph. This is how the, the, the posterior of the correlation neglect receiver changes when we add more and more signals. So again, we are repeating one signal, in this case, two times, three times, or 10 times. And you can see that the, the, that the posterior of the receiver becomes nearly a step function, right? So by deviating a little bit from the prior, you manage to get a very, very high posterior. And in this case, I mean, uh, we are gonna be able to send, I mean, this is slightly higher posterior than the prior with a very high probability reaching uh, a, a utility for the sender that is near the, the first best of the sender. Okay, so, so and, and this is in the, I mean, this is for all prior. So if uh, the utility of the sender from the solution of the modified problem is gonna convert to her first best, as the number of signals increases. So full correlation, if you have lots of signals, does a very good job. So uh, I guess that I should finish here. Uh, let me put up the, con the, 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 the conclusions um, and open the floor to more questions. Uh, so, Max, over to you. Yes. Uh, uh, so thank you very much for, for a great talk. Uh, you are, I mean, bang on time. So um, uh, I think Antonella Yanni had a, a question. So Antonella, can you unmute yourself or do you want us to unmute you? I unmute myself. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. I think I've already received the, the answer to one of the questions, but I raise it anyway, if there's anything you want to add. And my question was, uh, uh, 
you know, this behavioral heuristic that consists in uh, understanding perfectly marginal distribution, despite the fact that this may be very complicated, mm -hmm. and not being able to identify correlation. I wonder, you know, if there's any experimental motivation for that or if there's any, because, you know, in terms of uh, limited, say, computational ability, you would think that those apply to both. But here there seems to be a distinction between understanding complicated things, but missing the correlation. And the closest example I can think of is my students when they write down <laughs> that the, the, they miss the covariance term or something like that uh, in finance. And I think in the chat I was given references that I don't know of, so um, Thanks for that. And the second one was just a comment on this last part of the talk, this repeating signals. I was reading recently about bots. Right. Used on Twitter. And, uh, and your results seem to provide a theory for uh, using bots. And uh, bots are these uh, robots that retweet or send uh, the same message over and over to list of contacts and uh, they're automated, they're robots, they're called bots in the jargon that I don't know much about. Um, but your uh, results seem to provide uh, a theory for a rationale for using bots in uh, affecting and manipulating opinion in social networks in a very direct way. Sure that if you wanted you found, you, you may find uh, uh, empirical evidence for that. These were my two points. Thank, thank you, Antonella. So, so um, I didn't know the existence of these books, but I'm, 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 I'm gonna look at them. <laughs> That's very interesting. Um, I mean, I yeah. So, so um, regarding your previous, uh, the first question that you set up. Um, I mean, it's true, we are assuming a lot of uh, sophistication from our receiver on the one hand, and then a uh, completely naivety uh, when, when the signal, I mean, when we go into the joint uh, information structure. Um, I mean, so, so of course, I mean, this is a simplification. Uh, we don't think that people understand perfectly any marginal, and we don't think that people uh, perfectly think that all the signals are independent of each other. Uh, but still, I think that there is a ranking of, of sophistication. So, so one thing is to understand, uh, I mean, whether uh, a particular newspaper is linked or what, uh, I mean, one view or not, uh, and and you might have instances of that newspaper, you know that it comes from the same newspaper, and you can kind of understand, get a sense of um, the information that is on, on, on that signal. Um, another issue is to, is to think of different signals that come from different sources, uh, and, and being able to disentangle you know, when, I mean, these, these two sources are saying things that are very similar uh, and, I mean, and disentangling this as well from the conditionality of, of, of the state. So, so I, I, I do think that uh, there is, I mean, of course, this is a stylized model, but I do think that uh, understanding a joint correlation structure uh, is, is maybe harder than understanding uh, imagine. So maybe your students have <laughs> a, a point. Can I add uh, something here? Uh, sure. sure. No, just about the bots. Uh, no, that's, that's a very good uh, point. And actually, uh, Julia Cage had a seminar on Friday in the DC Political Economy Seminar. I don't know how many people saw that. And she had this wonderful data set on Twitter. They basically have 70% of all the tweets in France in one year. And she actually took out all the bots out of her sample. And I would say, yeah, you know, because <laughs> I think that's really interesting to actually follow and see how these bots work and, and what do they actually do and how do they influence people's pro uh, propensity then to, in terms of behavior on Twitter, to react, to retweet, or to say uh, similar things. So actually, I think there's scope to actually doing some very interesting uh, literature uh, uh, thinking about these bots and, and there is there is a literature and, and yep. there's a method Julia mentioned a method that you can actually identify in your data which are the bots and which are yeah. humans 
I uh, think so that's, that's uh, what triggered my question, actually, although I didn't see that seminar, but I must have come across that uh, reference. It's something it's amazing, very interesting. Thanks. Okay. okay. Uh, Francesco wanted to ask another question. I don't see any other questions in the chat, uh, so I'll give the uh, 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 floor to Francesco. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Ines. So I just wanted to, to ask um, perhaps more on the theory side of things. Um, one question is, I can easily believe that, for example, bots, what bots do is they just retweet the same thing. So you, you see the same thing over and over and over again, and you just don't realize that it's basically the same company, the same people who are retweeting. You just think it's different people. You just, whereas here, so that I can believe, but um, it's perhaps credible to nevertheless think that when correlation is very high, people will identify it. So you guys have a, like either all or nothing, but maybe there is an intermediate stage. So I can see, I can identify when correlation is very high. I cannot really see it when it's a bit lower. Um, so how portable are these results here? Is it, is it, would it be possible to have a parameter that just captures a degree of correlation neglect now rather than full correlation neglect. And the other question, perhaps, um, it's not clear to me what you can do when there is no correlation neglect. In other words, um, I w do you guys have a benchmark? Is it, is it, can you leverage other things when people are fully sophisticated or not? Okay, so, so let, let me start with the second question. So if people are fully sophisticated, uh, then sending M signals is not going to buy you anything more than sending just one signal because you are going to form a, a single posterior after all the signals and you are going to aggregate them correctly. So, so, so we, we are back into the unidimensional Bayesian persuasion model, uh, if you want. Uh, I don't know whether this responds to your question, but that's that's one thing. Let me of course, let, yes. <laughs> let me go into the. Uh, so I, absolutely. So so this is a stylized uh, heuristic. Uh, we have in the paper paper uh, many other heuristics, uh, some even more extremes, and some that uh, um, I mean have this feature that uh, you are mentioning, which is well, maybe maybe we can cap somehow, uh, I mean, the extreme correlation neglect that these individuals might have. And, and the idea is that, I mean, this amplification effect will go ahead. Maybe, maybe it's less extreme uh, than, than what we are uh, stating in, in the paper, but, but you could still move the posterior of the receiver in the direction that you might want to. So, so there might be some, so, uh, I mean, and, and let me, let me state something else uh, in, in the general result. Yeah, and I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't present them here, but uh, we showed that you could achieve, I mean, approximate the first best, even using negative correlation. So, so in, in that, so as, as the number of signal increases, right? So, so in that case, it's going to be harder for, um, the receiver to spot that mm, I'm receiving the same signal all and all over again, right? And still, I mean, you are correlating those signals in a way that is going to lead to 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 the behavior that you want from the receiver. So, so, so the fact that we are using full correlation, this is because it's something that is very understandable because we see instances of full correlation out there, uh, but we could relax this a little bit. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm afraid we are running out of time. There's another behavioral economics uh, webinar after us and we don't want to trespass there. Uh, there's uh, sure. four o'clock. Thank you very much, Ines. And I would encourage all uh, who didn't have a chance to ask a question to contact uh, the authors uh, directly and have a chat uh, about the, the issues. And uh, let's, uh, let's meet again in two weeks. I hope to see you and your colleagues who don't know about our webinar yet. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank, Thank you. you.